Okay, hello everyone. Hope you're having a lovely weekend. Medlink Students has decided to organize this virtual conference for you guys to give you insight into studying medicine abroad and in Europe, starting from the first year specifically. So during this conference, you'll learn about the opportunities available for you abroad and online, and you'll be able to ask as many questions as you like. Today, we have a great lineup for you of great speakers who are doctors, dental students, and medical students who are currently studying in Europe. And on top of that, we have our own meddling students expert advisors. They are ready to share their experience with you to help you make a confident decision on studying abroad so you can be well informed and decide on which is the most suitable option for you. So with us, we have Dr. Sam, a British doctor who graduated from Romania and is the founder of Medlink Students. Dr. Sam is a dermatologist and Sam has been guiding and advising international students like you on studying abroad and on the options available for medicine and dentistry in Europe since 2012. I'm Osman. I'm one of the student advisors at Medlink Students. We have also Edmund, who is a senior student advisor. He has helped hundreds of students pursue their dream of studying abroad, just like yourselves. We also have Dr. Lasha from uh, European University in Georgia, and we have uh, our own uh, exciting uh, cohort of students from various universities and locations across Europe who will talk to you about their own experiences of studying abroad. So in today's presentation, we'll cover a wide range of topics, especially ones that you guys have asked us about and uh, sent us questions about. So we'll start with introducing ourselves. Um, we'll talk to you about why you should study medicine abroad or in Europe or anywhere. Um, we'll talk to you about the difference between the UK and Europe. We'll talk uh, about medical universities, where the degrees are recognized, the tuition fees and living costs, where you can study medicine online and how we can help you with all this. Uh, we'll also add on top of this, how you can organize clinical rotations from your own home country, whether it's the UK or anywhere else. We'll also talk about COVID since many students have asked us about it. They're worried about the situation and how it will affect them. And we'll talk about Brexit finally. And then after that, we'll give you as much chance uh, to ask as many questions as you have or as you like. We'll try and um, do it all in about an hour. So just bear with us while we whiz through it. So uh, we are Medlink students. We're a team of doctors. Uh, we set up this organization uh, and it has become the leading international students choice for two consecutive years in 2019 and 2020. Our organization is inspired by doctors for students like you. We have boots on the campus of 40, over 40 medical universities all over Europe. And we have advisors for each specific university to guide you and tell you the positives and the negatives so you can make, make sure that you're making the most informed decision about where to go. I'll ask Dr. Sam uh, to talk a little bit and expand on this. Hi there, everyone. Uh, thank you, Osman, uh, for the introduction. And uh, I'm really glad that we are continually growing and being able to reach uh, even more people every single month. And that has always been the target of setting up the organization, is basically getting all the students and the doctors, all of them under one network, one umbrella, and being able to guide and support each other in order to continually help people achieve their dreams and further basically develop their uh, uh, degrees after they graduate, being able to travel and go back and work as doctors and become some of the most successful uh, doctors in their countries in the UK or any other country they wish to go to. Uh, it's something that has always been a passion of mine is making it as easy as possible to apply in order for uh, the potential students who want to become doctors being able to concentrate just on their careers instead of sitting and reading hours and hours on the internet about different universities, different protocols, how to apply and legalize documents, they can sit and 
kind of read more about medical related issues, up to date knowledge and being able to do what they love instead of chasing after paperwork, which is normally an admissions kind of job or a legal secretary work. Now, obviously, you still need to do your release research and due diligence. So that's why we try to keep everything under one umbrella, give access to people all around Europe studying so they can give you first hand experience of how things are and help encourage you because it's always a tough step to make it to leave, especially for UK students to leave home is one of the biggest things, uh, including me, like once you're not accepted in medicine, you normally go for a second option probably something medically related or something completely different or you just simply give up or wait for another year to apply to somewhere else and we wanted to open up and let people know that it's not all over if you don't get one of the four or five options in the UK because it is competitive constantly you are being rejected even if you have the grades and the academic achievements or sometimes maybe you mess up your A-levels and you can't really apply and uh, we don't want people to lose on their dream for making a mistake for once or for one year or twice, like basically a couple of years during A-levels and then not being able to pursue their dreams because we are confident that passion comes before academic achievements and if you do have the passion, normally you will succeed in anything in life, especially in medicine because it's something that needs dedication and you need to love what you do. And uh, we know a lot of people would love this opportunity and we wanted to make it as easy as possible. That's why here you have a huge lineup of students who are also joining this kind of culture and uh, helping each other to pursue their dreams and achieve them. And also at the same time, have fun for six years of traveling around Europe and make this an exciting opportunity instead of a dreadful one or a sacrifice to make for a plan B. We want to make the plan B, which is most students' plan B, be like an exciting opportunity and adventure. And they come back to the UK even stronger, more confident and ready to kind of face the hospitals and be one of the best surgeons and help us also continue to grow and help other people achieve their dreams. So if we move on to the next slide, I'd like to mention a little bit about Europe and uh, the difference between Europe and the UK and why it's good to go and study in Europe. And a lot of people put it down as option B or kind of if they don't get in the UK or their country, they go for the second option. Even though it is an option B, it is a wonderful option. I believe is superior to studying in your own country. And reason being is because you leave your comfort zone. And as a doctor, you are not always going to be ready for the situations and scenarios you're put in. So you need to be confident in being able to handle new situations constantly uh, changes and being able to adapt and help others at the same time and because as a doctor you cannot crumble people are looking for you for comfort they're looking for you to solve their problem and you need to be that person so traveling to Europe kind of puts you in a situation where you have to go adapt learn a new culture meet new people and uh, get out of your comfort zone probably learn some new language as well uh, and this I have seen throughout your years, as Osman said, since 2012, people seem to be coming back with a lot more confidence, a lot more problem uh, solving skills. They kind of uh, just find the solutions for problems alone and just fix them and get on with things and seem to be much, much more independent, which is a, a great thing to see. And it's something that was overlooked earlier on. Uh, regarding Europe but now people are starting to understand it much more especially UK hospitals and UK doctors they are seeing these European graduates come back and fighting for places and someone basically willing to leave home leave the UK sacrifice six years obviously shows a lot of passion and dedication and the fact they want to succeed because it's not an easy step but it is a fun one it's a nice one and it's definitely something worth taking another aspect of going to Europe is Patients are much more friendly towards having a foreigner approach them and ask them if they can clinically examine. You can um, get more involved in the hands-on work in Europe rather than the UK, for example, where they're a little bit more fussy. They kind of don't let you come and examine them. They say, no, I want the doctor. I don't like students coming and getting involved in my business. 
Well, you find here in Europe is the inverse. They really like a foreigner coming. They like get excited to meet you and speak with you, even though there's limitations in the language. You always find nurses also chipping in and students, local students coming in and helping you out with the translations and stuff like that. And you never feel lost because people are really open and understanding and they've always had international students and they love meeting people. So that's been another advantage of gaining clinical skills, clinical knowledge, clinical experience. And the fact that you can communicate with someone with a different language, you speak with them English through an interpreter, just makes you try even better to understand people and gets you to be more precise during your diagnosis and ask the correct questions and lead the story of the patient down to the correct diagnosis and then the correct treatment. Um, so that's another advantage that Europe has, along with gaining the confidence. Now I'll pass to Osman for the next uh, part, which is about the slides. The uh, thank you, Dr. Sam. Uh, so I'll take it from here, uh, just to add on top of uh, what Dr. Sam is saying, which is very insightful. Uh, lots of reasons uh, students choose to go abroad and study medicine abroad or dentistry. Uh, and the most important thing is that it is recognized and you can go back to your country and practice as a doctor or a dentist without much hindrance or much issues. You just have to usually go through the registration procedure and uh, which we will help you with as well. Um, there are plenty of options abroad. There are hundreds of medical universities or ones that teach dentistry or medicine in English specifically. So this is all about studying in English. Um, there's so many options, there's so much variety, there's always a choice for each and every single person that comes to us or considers going abroad, uh, whether with us or not. Um, and you can apply to as many universities as you can. For example, in the UK, there are sometimes some restrictions, like you can apply to four medical schools maximum, uh, or other countries are the same as well. Here abroad, you can apply to unlimited options, as many as you like, and we can help you with this as well. Um, there's no need to take really difficult exams like the GAMSAT or the UCAT or the BMAT. And um, usually universities will have sometimes an English exam or no exam or a simple biology and chemistry exam to just check that you have the basic knowledge. Um, the tuition fees are also really good and reasonable where uh, they are affordable for people where it starts from 3000 pounds or 3000 euros per year approximately and then uh, it goes up depending on the choice that you take. Um, the facilities are great, they're very good. The universities are um, uh, rena world renowned, so they are very uh, famous and popular with regards to students choosing them uh, for their studies. So let's go on to the options now. There are, like I said earlier, hundreds of options. However, the students from the UK, USA, Australia, Ireland, uh, generally from the English speaking countries, Canada as well, they generally go to gravitate towards these options. We found that they have become more popular recently and uh, students have enjoyed the facilities and the available options with regards to Ukraine, uh, specifically Dnipro Medical Institute. We have in Bulgaria, in Poland, in Romania. We also have a university in Germany, which uh, we can help you get into. All these are in English and um, uh, last but not least, in Georgia, we have an exciting opportunity available. I'll uh, let Dr. Sam uh, talk to you a little bit about this, uh, European University in Tbilisi. Um, yes, uh, now Georgia is a new option that uh, we've been exploring, to be honest, for quite a while. And there's been gaining, uh, a lot of people have been asking about Georgia. It's one of the countries that has risen really fast in the last few years. That's something great about Eastern Europe in general, is the countries are really developing as fast as they can. They're really trying to develop uh, the younger generation in those Eastern European countries, such as Ukraine, Georgia, Romania, Bulgaria. They really want to kind of catch up with the West and develop their old styles and change things. And we love that about them, especially, for example, something in Georgia, in the European University in Tbilisi, uh, the university really is willing to kind of adapt and change the, and uh, bring in a new culture in order to attract a teaching style that is a British system. They're not looking just to attract British students, obviously, but they like a lot the British system of teaching, which has attracted many Americans and Canadians in the last few years. 
And that's something that they are willing to implement. And uh, it's a really exciting opportunity that we're looking forward to. I mean, the university has spent several months talking with us and uh, discussing going back and forth in the best way possible to set up like some sort of collaboration where they could accommodate and the ways they could develop themselves and change in to fit well with the models and to fit with models such as the Dnipro Medical Institute, which you all guys know is the biggest uh, British hub in Europe for students. And Georgia would like to do the same. I mean, the exciting thing I like about Georgia is the fact Dnipro is a city, but Georgia is the, in the capital, the university is in Tbilisi. It's very accessible as well. And there are a lot of universities over there and uh, it's a university that we also have with us one of the international directors who has been kind of uh, collaborating with us in or and he'll give you a lot more information about the university and why you guys should go to georgia and why it's one of the great countries even the tourism has uh, risen quite significantly before the uh, covid period uh, which has restricted things so it's an exciting opportunity and uh, the other universities are also good. Uh, They've been very popular, but Georgia is looking to put itself on the map. And I believe it's one of the rising uh, places that you guys will be visiting. A lot of you will be joining this year as well. Um, so I'll let Osman continue. All right, thank you, Dr. Sam. We'll cover uh, Georgia a little bit more thoroughly uh, in a few slides. Uh, let's go on to the next one where we'll talk a little bit, uh, we'll introduce the first university, the Dnipro Medical Institute in Ukraine, where many UK students and uh, other English speaking countries have uh, really enjoyed uh, the teaching at. So you know, the university has been in like an educational hub for international students specifically from the UK, USA, Canada, Ireland and Australia. Um, it offers both undergraduate medicine and dentistry and graduate medicine and dentistry. So that means that if you have a degree, you can uh, usually uh, uh, have some subjects recognized and skip into the third year. And uh, usually if you've graduated from high school, you enter into the first year, meaning that you study six years of medicine or five years of dentistry. Then you graduate and then you can go back home practicing as an MD, a doctor or a DMD, which is Doctor of Dentistry. So the great thing as well, which is convenient for students, why they like it is that there's no entrance exam and there's no interviews. It's all based on your file and your application. If your application is strong, uh, they will consider you. It's uh, also another very attractive thing is that it's very affordable, which is very accommodating for students, uh, especially those self-funding. Um, there's so much extracurricular activities as well, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and the living costs are very reasonable as well. Um, we also have our on-ground office near the university, which provides continuous support to students. So I'll uh, bring in here Christina, who is the head and the chairman of the student union at Dnipro Medical uh, Institute. Um, and uh, Christina, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about your university and what kind of extracurricular activities you've been designing for students to help them acclimatize and uh, enjoy their time at, uh, in Ukraine? Sure. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Christina. I'm a fourth year medical student chair at DMI. And as Osman said, I'm head of the student union. So unfortunately, due to the COVID pandemic, a lot of our goals and things that we had in plan had to be put on pause for a bit but we're all back now starting first of March we're starting uh, in class again so a lot of our um, plans are going to be revitalized to say the least. Um, so DMI like Osman said is a great university within Ukraine it's very affordable and um, it also has a very large community of international students from all over the world not just the UK a lot of students from different African continents as well as the Middle East um, so with regards to the SU and the extracurricular activities, one thing that we really noticed within DMI is that it was important to get students um, integrated into things that are non-medical related as a bit of a break from <laughs> being consumed by medicine 24-7. So before the COVID pandemic, we had um, the intentions to implement different sports um, uh, teams. So there is a currently there's a currently a soccer team that is available and they meet I think every Thursday and they also play tournaments. Um, there was more hopes of bringing in teams for uh, netball, rugby, 
basketball and I think a swimming team was also in the developments. We also have a lot of societies. So we have the Tamil society, we have the African Caribbean societies. We have um, something that I'm a part of is the scientific research society. And right now we're actually doing a research program based on the vaccination and stu medical students reactions towards that. So if you're interested in being published within a journal, uh, that's something to look forward to as well. Um, we also collaborate with a lot of the medical doctors here who are helping us with our research. Um, we also made an orientation week. Unfortunately, last year's one had to be virtually as we were in the middle of a pandemic, but hopefully following on for the new intake of students, we'll be able to have a O week that is in person with the new, new students. We also have plans to introduce more social activities such as bar hopping, socials, and there is talks of making a medical ball in the near future. So yeah, this issue is here to support the students, not just academically, but also socially as well. And we really are excited to get into uh, that as soon as COVID becomes under control. Ah, brilliant, uh, Christina. You also, um, you guys did something amazing as well, which was some training sessions uh, like uh, uh, so life support and so on. Uh, would you like to tell us about these a little bit? Uh, actually, <laughs> I completely forgot about that. Sorry. I've been traveling for three days. Um, so yeah, we, while during the pandemic, we decided that we'd want to make some medical emergency workshops and you can actually watch them on our YouTube channel. I'll send the link in um, the chat. But basically what we did was it was a five part series of medical emergencies um, in, with regards to emergency medical aid and was taught by students who either have level one, two and three um, life support as well as qualified nurses and um, physicians assistants so it was students who taught um, these classes and we basically just covered different medical emergencies with regards to medical first aid and it was really well supported and was really well attended and we're hoping to have more of these sessions but in person when we come back um, and hopefully keep recording them and uploading them to our youtube channel another thing that we did was we made a few videos with regards to Dnipro, so what the city is like, how to find an accommodation, as well as um, a, a F and Q video. So if you guys are interested um, in DMI and the Student Union, you can also go watch those videos. We also have an Instagram and a Facebook page where we post a lot of updates on there as well. So that's some <laughs> that's extra information for you if you want it. Yeah, thank you, Christina. This is great. Uh, I hope you guys that gives you an insight uh, regarding what kind of activities there are outside medical school. Just to cover quickly inside medical school, Christina, uh, one final question. How have you found the online teaching uh, from the UK doctors at Dnipro Medical Institute? So we are very, I mean, everyone can be attested to the fact that online studying is not easy and being a medical student, it's even harder. But we're very, very lucky that with collaboration with MedLink, we've actually had a lot of extra online classes. So we were fortunate enough to be taught by Birmingham University uh, doctors who have now been giving us lectures every day, except Sundays. Um, on relevant medical topics, as well as extra lessons from Dr. Valentine, who is a pediatric surgeon in uh, Dnipro. He's been giving us clinical classes. We've also had extra anatomy classes with Dr. Eagle. And then if you do come to Ukraine, there's CROC-1 preparatory classes that we've also been given. And I know the dentistry students are set to start practical classes next week um, in person. So the Birmingham University lectures have been really, really nice because as, although we taught by Ukrainian doctors, it's kind of refreshing to be taught by um, UK doctors as they teach in a different style and in the style that you're probably used to being back from the UK. And they also can bring up clinically relevant things to working in the NHS and the UK. They're also very, very smart and intelligent and they're very um, well practiced. So it's been really informative and it's, it's really um, something that the students look forward to every day um, to attend and we are very grateful for them so if you do attend i think you're going to make full use of them all right uh, thank you christina i think we've covered uh, dnipro a little bit uh, let's move on now to um, 
an exciting new university as well uh, that is very well established in Georgia in Tbilisi. Uh, Georgia is also a very popular option, like Dr. Sam was just saying. One of the main people who has worked hard and collaborated with us to set up the university to become more accommodating and suitable towards teaching students from English speaking countries like the UK, USA, Ireland, Australia, Canada, everywhere that uh, students come from and other countries as well, um, is Dr. Lasha, who is uh, the director of the university. So Dr. Lasha, uh, would you be able to tell us more about uh, the university and how it is uh, a suitable university that students should consider? Um, thank you so much for introduction. It's been quite interesting. And uh, so the students can uh, uh, can see from your introduction of Tripnor Medical University, what you are doing and how much you are investing into the medical education for the British or American students. What I can say about the uh, European University in Tbilisi, Georgia, European University uh, is one of the fastest growing and progressive universities in Georgia, especially uh, in the field of medicine. We've got about, uh, and this number is uh, growing about 1000 international students at the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, the students are from various countries, from the Middle East, uh, from India, uh, and uh, what is interesting, and this can be interesting for incoming students from the point of medical accreditation. Uh, Georgian, and we've got this accreditation, Georgian uh, uh, medical diploma is accredited according to the standards of World Federation of Medical Education. And in Europe so far, that's uh, only Georgia and the Netherlands are applying now. These are only two countries which uh, have got this level of accreditation. And what's the profit of that for the students? The profit is that uh, the diploma is recognized not only in the European Union, uh, but in the English speaking countries as well, in the UK, uh, in the USA, in Canada, in Australia, in New Zealand. Um, and that's, uh, that's very important for the students who come to study in Georgia and they get Georgian medical diploma. The second thing I can say European University uh, is its uh, dedication to students. Um, of course, the learning is conducted into the English language. Uh, what I mean in, uh, in dedication to students uh, the students, uh, when they just come to a university, we always try to give them feeling to feel, of course, in Georgia, in Tbilisi, but at, at the same time at home. We've got several clubs and communities for international students. And we always try, for example, to commemorate and to remember the days uh, which are important uh, for specific communities. For example, last time we had the Indian Republic Day and Indian students celebrated the day with our professors and administration. Uh, and several times we hold uh, the cultural events which are interesting for uh, the international community. So in this case, what I'm saying is that when you come to the European University, our main goal is you should not feel abroad, you should feel at home and you should feel safe and connected to the faculty. The students always get the support from the faculty and from the administration. They've got their personal managers and they can always contact them face to face or online. One interesting point in the university is that, of course, it's got a very, very interesting infrastructure. So what you see in the picture here is a slide that's a medical campus, which uh, is a seven story building with uh, modern and brand new infrastructure with its laboratories uh, and uh, um, all the facilities which is uh, required uh, for medical students. And, uh, but here is also an interesting thing that uh, we also thinking not only just to locate the students in Tbilisi in Georgia, 
but to give them opportunity to go abroad. For example, many of our students take exchange programs uh, for one month or for two weeks as they go for medical clerkship in several countries. For example, last year we had the students um, in, in this kind of program in Hungary. And this year we are sending the students to France and to other European countries for medical clerkship. And so their plans are big. So we hope that next year when this pandemic will be uh, more or less over and we'll have the opportunity to send the students abroad, all our professors are most, mostly the leading clinicians and practitioners as well in leading Georgian clinics. For example, program director of the medical program is uh, at the same time a director of Georgian National Center of Tuberculosis. What I'm saying is that uh, the professors who will teach you in the university campus at the same time will be your guides in other medical clinics as well. And it means that just uh, your clinical years will be spent in hospitals, as well as in the university campus, in laboratories, and you'll have hands-on experience, which is very, very important, as you know, for future, for future doctors. That's uh, shortly what I can say about the European University. I okay, so. yes. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lasha. Thank you. That was very thorough and insightful. I see a lot of students are asking now in the Q&A about the rotations uh, that uh, can take place uh, for students who study in Georgia or Ukraine. So we'll talk about these a little bit later. We have uh, Emma, who's uh, our expert on organizing rotations. We'll talk about these. Um, so let's move on to now studying in Bulgaria. Uh, we'll try and make it uh, uh, as fast as possible because we have two uh, very good students from Bulgaria. So we'll start with Florian, who is an Austrian student currently studying in Bulgaria. Uh, would you be able to tell us more, uh, Flo, about yourself and uh, uh, how you found Bulgaria and studying medicine in English there? Hello, guys. Um, yes, yeah, as you already said, I'm a um, fourth year student in Medical University Varna. Uh, Varna is like the third biggest city in Bulgaria, located um, directly at the Black Sea. Um, so from the climate, you can see, because it's the sea, it's really nice. Um, uh, I really like the university because you really have the feeling that the university cares about our students. We see a lot of investing into the um, structure of the university. Like uh, in the four years um, I have studied there, they were like they tried to always um, to improve the university, improve the equipment they're using, and you can see uh, like uh, Sam already said, they try to catch up um, with the West already have um, caught up. To be honest, um, I did a couple of rotations already during the summer internships in um, Germany and Austria. And I've seen that there were no um, differences compared to the um, students that studied, for example, in Germany or in Austria. If you um, work hard, you're interested in the subject, which obviously is everybody, because otherwise you wouldn't watch this and try to study medicine, then you will have enough knowledge and you will have the skills to um, compete with the students from your home country. I have no doubt about it. Uh, we have some uh, extracurricular activities, um, which is, I think, has every university in common with a lot of foreign students because you come to another country, you don't know anybody else, and you so, so you try to um, connect with the people, and it's just a natural thing. So you have some clubs, you have like tournaments, football tournaments, or um, some meetings with um, people like we have a lot of meetings where Bulgarian students try to teach us Bulgarian where you can meet up once or twice every week and so you just come in contact with people from all over the world and I'm really glad I made this decision it opened up my eyes just to have a, a more international view on things yeah yeah, thank you, Flo. And uh, has Medlink, how have you found Medlink with regards to settling in and uh, acclimatizing in the country when you yes, first came? Of course, um, it's taking an agency is something that um, takes, because 
for, I have to explain. For me, it was like um, I took the decision really late because I was um, not sure if I really wanted to go abroad. And then there was no time. And I thought, like, if I do it now, which like was like three weeks before um, the deadline, I took an agency and it was, was um, much easier because they take the stress away because they take care of all the paperwork for you. And when you settle in, there is somebody waiting for you at the airport, taking care of you. So you come into a country and you already have the feeling that you know somebody. And it uh, it takes um, a little bit of fear away to, to say so. OK, fantastic. Thank you, Flo. Um, we'll move on to Jamal, who is uh, also a student in Sofia University in Bulgaria as well. Would you be able to tell us more, uh, Jamal, because you're in the third year now studying medicine. Um, yeah. Would you be able to tell us more about how you've uh, been able to get more hands-on experience in Europe compared to your home country? Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank you, everyone, by being in this great conference. And uh, I want to thank also Midlink family for uh, inspiring us. Uh, because, yeah, Midlink, uh, I have a long experience with uh, Midlink. Uh, Midlink is not only agency uh, that, uh, that gives students uh, or help them uh, getting uh, their document done and everything. Media, uh, Midlink is inspiring every one of us, uh, guiding us uh, and uh, helping us uh, choosing the right choice. Um, thank you, Dr. Sam and Dr. Osman by um, giving us this really important information that it was really uh, helpful for us. I wish that I had this information before four or five years ago. It will help me and uh, it will uh, absolutely uh, let me save time by choosing the right choice for me. Uh, as you said, uh, Midlink have many options and many universities to study medicine in Europe. And um, like every student see what he needs or what university suits him and uh, Midlink helping uh, us by giving us uh, more option and seeing exactly um, what the students need. I want to speak shortly about Sofia because before I come here to Sofia I was in Germany and uh, it was really difficult for me to get a place there. I spend uh, a lot of time trying to get a place and um, it was really difficult then i decided to come uh, to sofia bulgaria and uh, i don't regret that it was the best choice i did sofia uh, is like other european countries it's uh, in a process of development like uh, eastern europe so uh, the good thing uh, what i found here in sofia specifically what is like I saw it different than other universities, is the practical part. Um, since I started studying medicine, I got uh, many opportunities to work and do practice at the hospital. And actually it, it helped me a lot because as we know, medicine is not only theory. Of course, theory is important, but uh, as uh, like, other doctors' uh, practice is really important for us. And um, the motivation of studying and practice, uh, I really found it here in Sofia. Uh, I did a practice, uh, now I'm doing also a COVID department. I got many opportunities to do many kind of tests and practice, and I got uh, many help from different doctors. So really, I find it uh, interesting uh, and specifically here in Sofia, if you have the motivation to learn something and um, you involve, you can uh, go and uh, do some practice at the hospital, developing yourself. And uh, I also about the theoretic part. The university uh, system here in Bulgaria in general, and specifically in Sofia, uh, it consists uh, 
like six years, five and a half and one semester practice. And um, like uh, we have, after the second year, we start the practical part in the hospital. So you will have many hours also practice at the hospital. And um, what I also want to, to uh, say Jamal, that... uh, Thank you very much, Jamal, for this. It's very insightful. Yeah. It's okay. We will talk about the structure of European universities and how medicine and dentistry oh, work okay. a little bit later on. But thank you very much for your insightful information. Oh, okay. um, that was brilliant. So let's move on to the next uh, university. So next country. So the next country is Romania. Uh, where uh, uh, our student uh, Azad as well, who's now in the third year of medicine, will tell us a little bit more about his experience uh, quickly so we don't uh, keep you guys more than uh, what we promised. Yeah, hello guys, my name is Azad. Uh, like uh, Osman said, I'm in third year medical students here in Romania, a city called Craiova. Um, first of all, I was in UK, I wanted to apply for medicine, obviously, as uh, most of you are aware, how difficult and competitive it is to get in. If you don't get in first time, you'll have to wait for another year or two years, depends how lucky you get. And so I was looking around to see any other options to study abroad. I've never been abroad and I didn't even know how to do this. And I came across a few other uh, agencies, which I didn't really find it uh, reassuring. So I came at uh, the last minute, I found meddling students and I found them through online. And uh, I started speaking to him. So the first person I spoke to was actually Osman himself as well. So I'd like to thank him from here as well, because he actually gave me a gateway to, to go to medicine. And um, I can't thank him and his team enough for this. And so I started with them straight away I, because they rest, uh, rest assured me and I felt a belonging to them. I didn't feel like this is just an agency. For me, it was like from the, this, the moment that I started speaking to them for me, it was like a family relationship rather than just an agency. And this was very important as, a, as, a, as an agency for recruiting students to study medicine and dentistry and so on. So they gave me my option and so on. And like I said, I didn't know anything about studying abroad and they gave me a few options. And I decided to stay in Romania, to study in Romania because it was financially affordable for me. And uh, they told me that they'll pick me up, they do all the application and everything else. So I started with them and the application process literally took a couple of weeks and because I applied late, we usually get our results about late in August. So I applied late and uh, in a couple of weeks time, I was accepted. So I came to uh, Romania in, in Bucharest first and they picked me up. There was a few students waiting for me there from meddling students. And I was really, really um, brightened when I saw them because I thought, you know, it's too good to believe, right? And so they picked me up, they took me to my place. The, the apartment was already ready. They, so obviously they showed me the pictures and so on and they booked the, the apartment for me. I went to my apartment, everything was ready for me. And the next day someone else came to take me around to show me around the university and to meet other people as well. Like I said, I, had, uh, I didn't know any a single person uh, back then, but now uh, I'm in with many I mean, a connection with many uh, students that who are already graduated, who are already working as a doctor in UK in other countries as well. And one other thing I'd like to say that about the, the university, the university itself is really good. Uh, we don't have too many students here. So every year for English section, we have 60 students. Uh, this is really good compared to some other universities that might take 500 or 600. So you can imagine the difference when you have a good relationship with your professors as well, because uh, 60 people, obviously, everybody will get to know their professors easily. And this is a very good opportunity for this university that I'm at in Craiova. It gives you the opportunity to speak to your professor whenever you need to. And uh, just quickly about the hospital, the hospital is really good as well. So as a student, you can start going to obviously be uh, shadowing doctors from year one, if you want to. Once you get to know your professor, they're really friendly. As long as they know that you're keen and you want to study, they are there for you. So it's up to you, just like everywhere else. If you study in UK, in Germany, in France, it's up to you. If you're a good student, if you're putting the work into it, the professor will be there for you as well. Uh, that's that about, about the accommodation. Usually you pay around about 300 pounds maximum and you get everything furnished. Uh, most of the apartments here, the students are in is brand new. 
So the life here is compared to where I used to live in the United Kingdom. It's for me, it's a king life, you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna joke about this. And um, I'm also glad to have here, to have you guys here and uh, give you my experience as well. And I'm also glad to be uh, graduating in three years time where uh, the founder of Medling student, Dr. Sam has already graduated as well. So that's something uh, exciting for me to mention to anyone else in the future that you want to study here abroad, especially in particularly in Cryova. Um, okay, uh, thank you Azad, uh, that was very insightful. Uh, let's continue the discussion a little bit later in the Q&A. That was really insightful, lots of details, very thorough. Thank sure. you very much. Any questions I'll be, I'll, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer uh, if I missed anything. Okay, yeah, brilliant, thank you. Uh, so I hope you guys, uh, if you have any questions, just type them in the Q&A for any of our speakers and uh, we'll be happy to answer them and ask them later on to our speakers uh, in the Q&A section. So uh, let's move on to the most frequently asked question, which is, is the degree recognized and where is it recognized? Um, so I'll bring in Edmund, uh, our senior expert advisor who helps students like you uh, study abroad. So Edmund, how do you usually answer students who ask you this kind of question? That's it. Thank you, Osman. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us and spending the evening with us. Um, we get this question quite a lot, and often it's, it stems from the, the concern of students knowing, wanting to know whether they'll come back and be able to use the degree. That's important. You know, you've done the hard work, <laughs> gone abroad, and then you want to be able to come back and, and at least practice as a doctor. The answer is the, de the degrees that we, uh, the universities that we provide or we work with are carefully selected and, and handpicked to al allow you as a student to go and practice and come back. They're also listed in the world directory of medical schools. So this is very important when you're considering going to a university abroad. We have to look for these universities and help you go there and come back and be able to register because it shows that the universities are actually uh, accredited in their own country. Um, so a university listed in the World Di Directory of Medical School is always a great indication that, well, one, they're accredited in their own country. And when you come back, most of the students that we talk to are from the UK. Um, currently, the General Medical Council are preparing to introduce a, an exam called the Medical License Assessment. So, every student's gonna be required to do this, whether you've studied in the UK or abroad. It means that everyone's in the same boat. And once you've done that, you go through the process, which is something we help you with. So the answer is yes, uh, the degrees are recognized and they're also recognized worldwide. Um, all you have to do is sit a small test, which then demonstrates your skills to show that you can practice safely and you have the skills to uh, practice as, as a doctor and we'll be, you'll be able to register for your license to practice. Okay, uh, thank you, Edmund. So let's move on to tuition fees and living costs, Edmund. Uh, how would you also describe this to students when they are weighing up the options of going abroad? That's a great question. Um, so from our experience, a lot of the students who go abroad are attracted to universities due to the, well, the fees, how affordable they are, the living costs, um, the quality of education as well. Now, the tuition fees in Europe, uh, generally, um, they stem from anything from 3000 euros. Um, in Romania, for example, it can be anything from uh, 5000 all the way to nine and a half thousand euros. Now, in regards to, you know, other countries in the US, the UK, I mean, years ago, the UK's tuition fees was about 3000. And then years later, it was increased. Now, it doesn't actually um, take up the quality of education, because you're still going to receive the same quality, you're still going to get the same quality of education as you would if you're in the UK. And you won't be you won't be compromised coming back because you'll still gain the same knowledge. There are other universities that charge 10,000 or above. Now, it doesn't mean that they're better. It just means that geographically, that is how much they charge for tuition fees. So you might find a Polish university or Hungarian or any, um, any other ones like Cyprus where they'll charge 20,000, but it still just means that the living costs generally will be higher than that. 
but you'll still receive a very good standard of education um, when you're studying there. So any, anywhere from 5,000 to 20,000, and it really depends on how much you want to spend. And one thing to note as well, studying abroad generally means that these are all self-funded. So students who come to us, we will help you find a university that will be affordable because student finance, unfortunately, doesn't work abroad. Okay, thank you, Edmund. Uh, and uh, just one thing I want to point out is that not many years ago, the UK used to charge £3,000 per year for tuition fees. So you can't really measure quality based on fees. Uh, so students tend to be smart with their money recently and nowadays. So that's why they, we usually notice that they choose the more affordable countries uh, to not make it too much of a burden on them financially and their parents as well. One thing I noticed on the slide as well, I just want to point out is that the tuition fees in Georgia are in fact 5,000 US dollars per year, which is approximately 4,500 euros per year or thereabouts. Um, just pointing that out. Okay, um, let's move on to the next slide with admission requirements. So I would like to bring in our expert uh, admissions uh, admissions expert uh, Victoria, who is in our UK office uh, supporting students and looking after their uh, files and making sure she creates a very strong applications for them. So uh, Victoria. Thank you. So let's be honest, most of, most of our students who go abroad to study medicine have already tried to get into a medical school in their country. As you will know, by now, there are far more students who wish to study medicine than there are places available. So even if you have top grades, you might not get the place. So instead of giving up on that dream and continuously reapplying again and again, year after year, it's better to study medicine abroad. So many students ask, what's the most common admission requirements for studying medicine in Europe? So you might want to write this down. So first of all, it's high school diploma or the equivalent certificate in your country's high school system. Then we need some good grades in chemistry and biology and or physic or maths. So sometimes universities will offer an entrance exam in biology, chemistry and English. They can be taken online, especially now during the pandemic or a simple online interview. So it just depends on how you feel and what you prefer. Uh, but please don't worry, we will prepare you for these exams by providing you with the material that you need at the exam. Some universities will require an admission fee. Some universities require an entry fee when you accept it, but that's to make sure that the seat is taken. You will need a passport and be able to speak English. And that's about it. So should we ask Edmund, what happens if a student doesn't meet an entry criteria? How can we help the student? That's a great question, Victoria. Thank you for that. So there are some students who will come to us. Yes, they meet the requirements. This is normally straightforward, but there will be some students that may have just biology and maybe another science subject, or they just have psychology or none. What we do is we look at other points where we can make your strong, your, a strong file for you and create a strong file. And so that when we submit to the university, we also want to tell the university that you are still the right candidate for the university. Even if you don't have the correct science subject, the biology, the chemistry, the physics, Whatever you might have, we will also look at things like your GCSEs. If you might have, you might not have A-levels, you might just have BTEC. But whatever you have, do not panic and don't give up on your dream. We will still look at what you have and then create a strong file. We'll look at points within your case and then make sure that we have everything that we need to ensure that you can still start studying medicine, which is something you should dream. Obviously, some of you are still talking to us because you're serious about what you want to do. So it, it's okay if you, doesn't, if you don't meet the requirements of biology and chemistry or A-levels, let's still have a look and then build a strong file for you to make sure that you can still pursue this dream. Thank you. 
All right, uh, thank you, Edmund. Uh, I hope that encourages students and inspires them. So let's move on to the next slide now and talk about how we can help you. Uh, I believe we've covered that quite thoroughly already by uh, uh, our students speaking about their experiences with Medlink students. However, we'll cover it really quickly here and uh, I'll ask Amy to chip in as well on uh, how she's found it. So Medlink students offers always uh, a consultation where you speak to an advisor like Edmund or someone else uh, who will help you find a suitable option for yourself. We help you plan the journey abroad and we provide you with continuous support throughout your uh, studies abroad. But uh, I, will, uh, I will not explain this myself. I will ask Amy, who is a third year student currently who's used the services of Medlink students. Um, and uh, Amy, since you've registered through us, can you tell us about your experience and how Medlink students continues to help you throughout your studies? Hi guys, good evening. So yeah, Medlink have been amazing throughout the whole process and they're still doing an amazing job as well. So I obviously um, had Edmund as my advisor. So he was really great going through all my options over WhatsApp um, and literally, yeah, um, going through everything that I needed to know and uh, regarding what documents I needed to send as well. The great thing I love about Medlink is that the communication is like on point, like every, even at the, even at the weekend, I do feel sorry about, uh, sorry for Edmund, but like, even if it's Saturday, Sunday, you can contact them at any point. Um, and they always um, kept me up to date with what documents were due um, to be um, handed in regarding registration, etc. Then when it came to registering and applying for my permit, um, to live in Ukraine and um, they sent me really comprehensive documents um, regarding every step of the way um, with how to apply for the visa then arriving in the country even like little things like uh, setting up a bank account um, your sim card for your phone etc uh, etc et so there was that as well and then um, as well when you get to the airport they pick you up from the airport they're there straight away um, and they have an office in basically all the countries that um, there's the universities with Medlink, there's an office as well. So they're there basically 24 seven, like there for you um, to go to. Um, and then, yeah, um, then they've been helping me throughout now, like finding accommodation, like referring me to estate agents that are reliable and they help me set up a bank account. Um, like uh yeah um and then they've literally been great as well with the whole process recently i've moved classes as well from online to offline um and yeah always keeping me in check and um, so i think the main thing really is that with medlink you will be able to move to the country abroad and just feel um, relaxed and if anything goes wrong because things do go wrong abroad and everything it's it's a new experience you're going to be scared etc but literally Medlink are just a call away Edmund's on WhatsApp <laughs> and um, yeah it's just kind of like um, someone I said uh, it's like having family and they always be the whole time literally um, always there for you so it's great. All right, uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, we'll ask you some extra questions in the Q&A uh, section. And uh, if you guys uh, have any questions for Amy, just type or for anyone else, just type them in the Q&A. Another thing I'd like to point out to you guys is that Amy is documenting her uh, journey from the UK to Europe. So she's been uh, doing vlogs and YouTube uh, videos where uh, I'm sure she'll post a link on the chat shortly. Yes, I will post now, guys. Please subscribe <laughs> and follow my medicine journey. Perfect. All right. Uh, thank you, Amy. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, I'd like to bring in Emma for this slide uh, and she will explain to us how uh, Medlink will be involved with uh, organizing rotations in the UK or USA for students who would like to do their rotations in their own home countries and uh, will guide you as well with organizing in other countries in the future. Uh, however, Emma will focus on the UK for now since uh, uh, Emma is an expert on this. So Emma, you've uh, been helping students with organizing these rotations. Would you be able to tell the students a little bit more about how it's done and the process and uh, what they should know? Okay, hello everybody. 
Um, the UK rotations are uh, amazing. I rotated in London. Basically, the first steps for rotating is um, you need to fill out some documents. You need to do your health checks. You need to do a DBS check and get a letter of good standing from your university. Um, on your after you get all that done and you're approved, on your first day you get um, you get you get um, assigned to a consultant and um, you basically are going to be with this course consultant throughout your clinical rotations and you're also with um, the FY1s and FY2s so you will rotate with them in say internal medicine in ops and gynae in, in pediatrics all different kinds of areas surgery um, uh, you can start a day anywhere from eight o'clock uh, till 10 depending on what you're doing and you get to do loads of clinical histories. You get to do lots of clinical examinations. You get a lot of bedside teaching, which really was really helpful. They ask you a lot of questions. And I, I do say that before you start your rotations, you should be, um, you should be pretty thorough in your knowledge in uh, cardiovascular arrest and GI examinations, because you, uh, you get asked quite a lot so, uh, about that, especially in internal medicine. When you get to surgery, maybe brush up on your neuro examination. Um, in terms of uh, the kind of help you get, you do get a lot of teaching. Um, if, and if you don't know your clinical very well or your examination, say your cardio exam or anything, they do, they do help you. There are classes. You do get live clinical se sessions as well. So I learned to suture. Um, you learn how to scrub in on a surgery. Um, and and the, the rotations really helped me. I thought I was really going to love, for example, orthopedic surgery when I went into it. And after I actually had to hold someone's broken leg in surgery for about so many hours, I decided that I don't want to be orthopedic surgeon, but it did help. It, it's really helpful in identifying what you want to do. Um, so I, I, I got to see cases such as hypertension, COPD, you see loads of patients, uh, anemia, patients with anemia, diabetes, you got to see patients with cancer. I got to see um, uh, patients that have had uh, breast surgery, complete uh, reconstruction. It really helped. And it really got, it really helped me see um, how important it is to rotate in my home country because I want to start, I want to do medicine in the UK. And because you get to rotate with the FY1s and FY2s and the consultants, one, you get to make your network, and two, you get to see what you're up against. You need because the it's quite competitive. I have to say it's quite competitive. So you can't go into a rotation and just be whimsical about it. You need to know what you're, you need to be fairly confident or at least appear confident. And actually you're representing your university. So you should go in there with, 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 with some knowledge. I think the universities, the NEPRO where I, I would be at, they, they cover this, they cover the clinical exam. So you would know, you should be able to get and get on the wards and stand toe to toe with the UK students. It's, um, it, I mean, but it's an amazing experience. And I think that um, anyone that's interested, they should get in touch with Edmund and he will uh, advise on how you should do that or how you can get to get to go to the UK and do those rotations, if there's anything else. Right. Anything else you need to know? Yeah, thank you, Emma. If you guys have any questions, just type them in the Q&A section and we'll answer them as soon as we can. So you can take this, uh, use this uh, opportunity for two universities at the moment, and these are the ones in Georgia and Ukraine, European University and Dnipro Medical Institute, who currently accept and allow you to do your rotations at home. Um, so you can, uh, if you have any questions, just contact us and uh, we'll put you in touch with Edmund or Emma and they will give you much more information. They are experts on this. Uh, so let's move on to the next slide now. So uh, a lot of students ask us about COVID and uh, they're a little bit nervous or they just want to, they're curious, they want to know more about uh, what, how COVID would affect their studies. So the universities have shifted to online since COVID has started and many universities have been very good at adapting and uh, quickly uh, getting used to the situation to provide, to continually continue to provide uh, the medical education that you need in as much of an interactive way as possible. Yes, it has its challenges, online studies, as you've all experienced now, 
uh, across the globe, uh, whether in schools or universities or colleges, you've seen what it's like. It's challenging for teachers but and students. However, the great thing about Europe is that the universities and us, we've worked together with them to provide as much possible support for them to uh, cope with the current situation. For example, we helped the Nipro Medical Institute set up an online portal uh, to help students uh, integrate with the uh, online studies quickly. Uh, I'd also like to ask um, Sam, who's a student uh, in Ukraine as well in Europe. Uh, he's been uh, what he's been attending online so far until the classes go offline. But uh, Sam, um, I'd like to ask you, how have you found the experience with studying online and the classes in Dnipro uh, plus the extracurricular classes that are provided for you? Hi everyone, um, my name is Sam. Um, well, with regards to answering your question, I'll say that basically the online classes are very good. Uh, Medlinks has been very um, effective and efficient with trying to supplement our studies. Um, so far, I think as Christina said prior, there is um, Dr. Valentine who's currently doing our clinical online classes, as well as we have a course that we're doing as well from the Birmingham, from Birmingham a course that we're doing in which Birmingham medical doctors have um, started teaching us, helping us to translate our basic sciences and amalgamate the knowledge we get from our basic sciences into actual clinical practice. Uh, the information that they give is very clear, concise to the point, as well as I would say it's very, um, for those of us who want to go back to the UK, um, and even if you wanted to go to another country as well, I would say it, it, it's, it's very, um, um, ideal in, with regards to helping you understand how the wards work and how how you as a junior doctor, as a future junior doctor, will need to behave as well as what the, the things you need to do in order to succeed as a, as a medical doctor. Um, there are multiple things that they do. Um, one thing I find really um, exciting is the rapid fire questions that they that they do on, at the end, during and at the end of the rotations. Uh, a nice way to help with memory recall with short and long term memory. Uh, on top of that, one thing that is really good is that they do take their time, even after the lecture, to discuss with the students with regards to um, personal things. So like how they climbed the ladder, how they their experiences as doctors from when they were junior doctors to now their, their current stages as consultants. So all in all, I will have to say that the, the online classes are really are very decent very good um, especially considering we're in the time of COVID-19 where you don't really get the um because of well depending on where you are and because of the restrictions and because of the restrictions related to the transfer of the of the of the virus obviously uh you don't really get that much um would I say that much hands-on practice so this is a very good supplement for that um for this for this current time that we're in I'll pass it back on to you, Osman. All right, thank you, Sam. Uh, that's very insightful, brilliant. Uh, I just want to ask Christina also to expand on this, um, since you guys have been studying medicine as well online. Uh, Christina, how has uh, some students have asked, uh, how has Medlink contributed towards the education of students in Dnipro? Um, sure. Well, Medlink has been nothing short of phenomenal, and that's not just blowing smoke. Um, when the SU came to Medlink and said, listen, there's certain things that we want to implement within the university, they were more than happy to assist us in um, organizing these classes. And um, something that blew my mind is I, I, I took a look at the timeline, and within the last three months from onset to actually um, it occurring. We've had the implementation of extra online classes, not just for anatomy, um, crop preparatory lessons. Every single day we have a different lesson with Birmingham University lecturers as well as clinicals with Dr. Valentine and to top it all off, dentistry students are getting in-person practical classes as well. Um, that's just our online support that they've implemented. Um, then if you go a little bit further, um, I think it was around the summer last year, so June, July, um, they we came up with the idea of implementing the online portal and within, sorry, give me a second. 
sorry, my, phone, my laptop was going to die. Um, and within two to three months, Medlink was able to code an entire online portal where we could um, collaborate and amalgamate all of the different information that we had available uh, to the students. Because in Ukraine, the online studies were kind of fractured all around because um, the lecturers were very used to using Google Classroom. Um, and we thought that it would be a better way to streamline the information if we had an online portal. And within three months, Medlink was able to do this for us. We now have a fully functioning online portal um, that supports both the online students and the in-person students. Every single year is categorized as well as the modules available, all the resources are uploaded there um, according to your different uh, rotations or um, subjects. We also have CROC 1 and USMLE um, preparatory material as well as Medlink has embedded tests into the online portal um, that you can use to test your knowledge. We've also got a huge bank of um, online lecture videos available to us um, in the format of the Luxuria style videos. So if you're used to Luxuria videos, they're very similar to that. Um, what else do we have on online portal? We also have basically every single medical textbook known to humankind is on the, on the online portal as well. So Medlink has been nothing short of amazing and supporting us, especially during online studies. Um, we have more information than we know what to do with it, to be honest with you. All right, thank you, Christina. Just to summarize, that was a really thorough, uh, lots of details there uh, about uh, how uh, online studies have gone. Um, we have always uh, dedicated our time and effort and energy always to try and help universities and students at the same time. That's why we started our organization, to provide the best value and the best possible routes into medicine and to also give so much opportunity to students that they have literally no excuse to say, oh, I couldn't pursue my dream of studying medicine or dentistry. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Uh, I'll ask Edmund about this because he's very knowledgeable on this. So Edmund, uh, how has Brexit affected studying medicine abroad for British students specifically, or for those wanting to practice in the UK afterwards? Okay. Uh, that's a great question. Well, a few questions in itself. Um, so there are two types now. So now there are, there are EU graduates and there are students who study outside the European Union. Now, the only changes now that has occurred uh, since January this year is that students who study within the European Union no longer have the rec automatic recognition of the uh, subject, uh, the degree. Now, this means that anyone that comes back has to go through a procedure with the General Medical Council, and then they can register. Now, from 2024, any student that comes back to the UK um, has to do the medical license assessment, which is being introduced by the GMC as a way of creating a common threshold for safe practice. This means that if you're a British graduate and an international graduate, you also have to do this exam, irrespective of where you studied. So you can go to Cambridge and study, or you can go to Harvard. It doesn't matter where. Everyone's gonna be given the same platform to demonstrate their skills. And this is similar to the US MLE as well. So it means that, for example, students who are Dnipro, who will be doing the CROC 1 and the CROC 2 exam, this will actually prepare you to come back and you'll feel confident to actually sit this exam because the CROC exam is pretty much similar to what the UK MLA will be introduced. So this changes that's coming is actually positive, which means that you can still go abroad if you're nervous about the degree not being able to, not being recognized when you come back. Once you've done that part, then you register for your provisional license or you can register for um, your actual, uh, your license to practice. Um, and we can help you with the whole process when you come back anyway. All right, uh, fantastic, Edmund. Thank you very much. Just to summarize, uh, what Edmund's saying is that no matter where you study, whether you study in the EU or outside the EU, if you come to Georgia or Ukraine, for example, you can still come back to the UK and you still have the same path uh, with regards to the opportunities available to you. Everyone is on the same pedestal. All right, uh, so let's move on now to the next slide. Uh, we haven't talked much about dentistry. Uh, we want to give some time to dentistry. We've brought... Uh, our uh, very good student, Ben, who is a fourth year dental student studying in Europe. He's from the UK. 
Uh, ben, would you be able to tell us a little bit about what it's like studying dentistry in Europe and uh, a little bit about your journey? Yeah, thank you, Osman, uh, for that introduction. Um, yeah, so my name's Ben. I'm from the UK, as Osman stated. I came about four years ago to Ukraine. Uh, it was an opportunity that was given to me at that point. So I'd like to thank Dr. Sam, who provided me with that opportunity to come study dentistry abroad. So, yeah, my journey started four years ago and I came to Ukraine. Uh, it, was, it was kind of different for me because obviously I've just been in the UK most of my life. And Ukraine is a different kind of country, different culture, learning a new language. And yeah, it was just, it was just kind of overwhelming for me at the start. I'm not going to lie about that. Um, after two or three weeks, once I started my lessons, I met people in my group, kind of made my friends then, helped me feel settled. And then I was doing my first year, which was a basic, like basic medicine, uh, like biology, chemistry. We did physics as well. We learned Latin, uh, anatomy. And then going on to my second year, it got a bit more intense, which I would tell everyone that's watching uh, this evening that I personally feel like second year dentistry is the most difficult. The reason for that is, is because it's, it's a lot of subjects and it's congested and it's a lot of... Um, a theory. So you have your patho pathology, which is broken up in pathomorph and pathophysiology. Uh, you'll have your microbiology, you'll have clinical anatomy, you have biochemistry. So these subjects are uh, like big in terms of theory. So that's what I find difficult because keeping on top of everything, you know, um, topic tests, um, as, as previous students have told you that uh, we have a lot of uh, topic tests every week to keep so the teachers can see if you're keeping up with your work um, and then obviously going into third year we started to get clinical um, clinical classes uh, cleaning teeth you know doing fillings and all that uh, so so for dentistry I would say that third year you will start your clinical the first two and a half years three years would be your theory and after that you'll learn all your clinics and stuff like that so what I would say is obviously during this uh, pandemic, you know, it's been COVID and obviously classes have been online and stuff like that. So I would like to thank Medlink as well in regards to giving us more clinical uh, private classes that I've been paid for. So I appreciate that. You know, I've been um, keep, I kept telling them that we need these because obviously with the COVID pandemic, you know, we're not getting a lot. We're just getting our theory. So I appreciate that. I appreciate Osman for doing that and Dr. Sam and all the Medlink uh, family for doing that. So yeah, so right now I'm in my fourth year, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie about it. I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed my four year stint over here. I've got an extra year left. I've just passed my croc one exam. So I was happy about that. And now focusing on my croc two. Congratulations. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So yeah, so just keeping on top of my online classes now. See, the thing is, once you do, once you do your croc one, everything else feels easy after that because you do nine subjects and it's that congested. Uh, there's about 15, 16 past papers, trying to understand everything, it's just phenomenal. So right now, everything feeling easy for me, it's feeling a bit more relaxed, you know, and going into fifth year, that will be my final year. So I can't wait till I finish, you know, I don't know, I don't know where I will go in the world. You know, I still haven't made that decision. Obviously dentistry opens up uh, several doors, you know, I've got a few countries in mind. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. Okay, thank you very much, Ben. That was very thorough. If you guys have any questions about dentistry, feel free to let us know. Again, another uh, option for uh, studying dentistry for five years would be um, Ukraine, Georgia, and Poland. They have, offer five-year courses. Other countries offer the six-year courses. Uh, thank you for that, Ben. Uh, plenty of clinical experience always coming your way in Europe as well. Uh, and it is recognized in your countries as well, like the UK and USA and so on. So uh, thank you everyone for uh, being patient, even though we went a little bit over time. Uh, it seems uh, we still have the same number of attendees anyway. It seems you guys are really enjoying the uh, webinar. So thanks for staying. Uh, we have now an opportunity for you to ask questions and uh, we can try and answer them for you. Um, so with regards to opportunities and uh, what to do, uh, a very good question is being asked is uh, for Emma, actually. Emma, someone's asking, uh, what determines which hospital someone gets the rotation in from Europe? 
wherever there's availability. So, for example, right now there's places available in London and uh, some hospitals are just not taking people at the moment because of COVID. So it just where there's availability, it's very competitive London for, for rotations, but there are rotations opening and there'll be a lot more in after September. It's just because of the COVID. So what, normally there's placements. All my friends have got placements. Uh, I've just got one that is, she started her plastics. She was a foreign student. She, she came from abroad, she's from Sri Lanka. And she started her, um, her, she did a six year course and she started now in plastic surgery, she called me. So, I mean, loads of foreign students uh, have gone abroad and come back and done all their rotations in UK, UK and they're working in UK. That's how they, that's how they also got uh, to know the surgeons and got to know people. That's how they got in, kind of, they got to know people and said, oh, would you be interested in taking me on after I finished my rotations? And so, um, there are rotations and I think they'll be happy to take people from, from the neat process. And if anybody's interested in, in four placements that are open already, please let um, Edmund know. Okay, in London, four placements in London are open. So please let Edmund know. Yeah. Brilliant, all right. Uh, thank you, Emma. Um, another question is, uh, I'll ask Dr. Sam this, is uh, how much does it cost for the rotations? I'll just uh, briefly cover that. Uh, usually it depends on the uh, on the hospital that you're going to um, and the prices do vary. So it's difficult to give an approximation, but uh, usually you have to go to a hospital that's more suitable for your budget. Dr. Sam, would you like to expand on this? Um, yeah, thanks for uh, adding me in in this one. Uh, rotations are always a great thing to gain confidence, like Emma was saying. Uh, once you go and study abroad, you kind of you do gain confidence and self confidence, and you are feeling like great because you're kind of battling in a different environment, different country. For example, in Tbilisi, in Georgia, you're kind of sorting out your own stuff and getting used with it. But you sometimes kind of feel that because it's been an option B and you've not been accepted first time in the UK, let's say for an example, or USA, you will feel like you're a bit inferior. So. Uh, You'd, you'd be like wanting to do some sort of placements in order to see and test your knowledge. And uh, I'm sure Emma and uh, anyone who has done rotations there will attest that your knowledge and theoretical knowledge as well as clinical knowledge are sufficient to take part. Now, regarding, regarding the cost, it really does matter on the season and the hospitals, but I would say an average of 200 to 300 pounds a week is normally the cost. It's something you are looking at, like uh, of paying. Um, some of the universities offer like on camp, uh, sorry, I mean the hospitals on campus accommodation where they give you a room where normally doctors would stay. Uh, those are kind of cheap. Uh, I remember paying for mine about £10 a night, something like that. I don't really remember exact figures, but they are kind of cheap and supportive of student prices. So try to contact the hospitals if they have places, they might give you places like a cheap place to stay in their accommodation. But you're looking around £200, £300. Uh, even though they're a little bit expensive, they are worth doing because they kind of give you that extra boost that when you come back to the UK, you're going to smash it, you're going to be absolutely fine and you're going to be able to continue with your medical journey. That's why we always want to be there as MedLink. Like I've heard a lot of guys mentioning that we're a MedLink family. I love the fact that this spirit is still going around and we want to always be there for each other. Not just, we're not an organization that wants to put people in medical universities and then walk off we want to stay with you throughout your journey make it as enjoyable and as beneficial as we can and our aim is for you to graduate and then be able to practice as a doctor not just to open the door and then tell you find it your way and we love to stay in touch so yes uh, being in uh, clinical rotations is a good uh, thing and it is definitely worth it. And I would say 200 to 300 pounds is a good approximation of the prices per week. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sam. That was uh, very helpful. Uh, keep the questions coming, guys. We're trying to reply to them via text and via uh, the call as well. Um, does the six years in medicine come with the foundation years or the six years plus two years of foundation years? Dr. Sam, would you like to chip in on this? 
Um, I think the question is a very common question, is whether the six years include the training year. Um, regarding the EU, if you do graduate from inside the EU, at the moment, the law was that you go back and you get a full license, which means you skip FY1 if you have to. However, you tend to have to do like a few months of FY1 before you can apply for FY2. But legally, yes, if you finish a six year course normally, you can apply to the FY2 posts immediately. You don't have to finish FY1, but generally you would do like three, four months of FY1 just to get your confidence up and get used to the system. Um, now, regarding, for example, Ukraine, uh, the UK does not recognize the a training year in Ukraine. So if you graduate from Ukraine, you will have to start from FY1. You don't get to the option where to skip. However, the, the option skipping going straight to FY2 is very uncommon. Most people want to do a few months of FY1 just to get themselves accustomed with the system. And uh, so I know as doctors, maybe in some people who have applied and missed out on a few years, we sometimes want to skip years and go, okay, I'm going to study six years and then I want to start uh, to skip years and get faster up the chain, basically. But I would like to tell you as a doctor currently working, I mean, you're going to graduate and work for around 40 or 45 years of your life. I'm sure if you work one less year, 44 or 43 years of your life or even 40, you ain't going to be upset about it. Don't fall into that trap where it's basically some of my parents, I think mentality and the old mentality where you have to graduate as fast as possible and beat everyone is not a race. You can become an average doctor and work for 10 years and basically just be average and someone come and in three, four years become a rising superstar. Uh, the age is nothing to do with it, just your passion. Uh, follow it through, don't worry about the number of years. Uh, just do your best, study, enjoy it. The most of all is enjoy the European experience. It is amazing. You get to go also on some Euro trips. I mean, Dr. Lasso was mentioning countries like around Georgia, which are like Armenia, you can go and travel, Turkey, um, Azerbaijan, these countries that most of us probably haven't been to. So going to that part of the world is exciting and it should be exciting for everyone. And uh, you should look forward to traveling and not worry about the number of years in these things. But as I said, to summarize, if you graduate at the moment from Europe, it used to be before UK leaving the EU, you used to be able to go straight into FY2. It was legally possible. If you graduate from outside the EU, normally you must uh, go to FY1. I hope that covers it in a good way. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Sam. And uh, I'd like to also add a little bit on top of this is that doing the FY1 is a really beneficial thing because this is the most junior uh, level of medicine. And this is your opportunity to make as many mistakes as possible without having so much repercussions. Because, you know, in medicine, you have the responsibility as well of not harming the patient. And if you make a mistake, then you are usually liable for it. So uh, as a consultant, you can get in trouble for that. But as a junior doctor, as an FY1, you can make as many mistakes as you like, of course, with reasonable mistakes, uh, not negligent mistakes, and still be able to not have too much problems. And this is why FY1 exists. It's there to give you an opportunity to practice and try and do your best and uh, just trial and error and see how you get on with the post. And then you move on to FY2 where you are responsible for FY1. So you need to know your FY1 knowledge in order to manage the FY1s as an FY2. So it is, we always, uh, even people who graduate from Romania or Bulgaria, they are eligible to go into FY2, but they choose not to. They choose to go into FY1, some of them, and we advise them to. What is one year? You're still getting paid. Uh, you're still gaining lots of experience. Uh, just to add on top of that. So some people are asking as well, what are the living costs in Eastern Europe? So uh, let's ask our students here who are more expert. They are experts more than us on this. Uh, Amy, would you like to tell us more about this? Hi, guys. Yeah, so I'm currently living in Dnipro, Ukraine. So I've moved in my accommodation last month and I pay the equivalent of 300 um, no, sorry, uh, 280 pound a month 
for my accommodation yeah that is the right um conversion and um, so yeah that's per month which is like hugely um cheaper than what I was paying in England then regarding living costs I'd say I spend around 20 30 pound a week it's literally so cheap guys and um, it's unbelievably cheap um, even my wi-fi is like two pound two pound a month and um, then for my phone bill it's uh, again like um four pound a month um and that's like unlimited wi-fi and everything and um, what else do I pay for? There's really not, not much. And I opened up a, a Ukrainian bank account as well. Um, so regarding money, living wise, um, you don't have to worry too much. And I think someone mentioned it before. You do like live like a queen. I live like a queen. Uh, you can, you can, it's very affordable. Do not worry. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Fantastic. It seems we're also getting lots of questions about Georgia, lots of interest as well. Um, Dr. Lasha, would you be able to tell us a little bit more about the living costs? Some students have asked about living costs specifically in Georgia. Uh, so uh, I can say that uh, living costs in Georgia are quite uh, relatively low. For example, per month for the student who is living uh, independently, uh, I mean food, uh, that can be about, uh, I can say, uh, um, that can be about 500 Georgian Lari, which is about 150 USD, US dollar. Um, the, the transportation is quite uh, affordable as well. Uh, for example, that's uh, about 10 cents. Uh, for one direction. Uh, we are offering, and that's, uh, that, can be, that can be good news for students, uh, we are offering a brand new, newly finished uh, hotel type dormitory for students. And uh, we, uh, we offer the students a double room, which is not a typical dormitory room, but it's hotel type room. Uh, fully furnished uh, with free with free wi-fi kitchen nets and all the things which are required for students uh, for 250 usd and the package includes uh, the room wi-fi um, food breakfast and dinner or two times uh, and uh, transportation from uh, our dormitory, from our dormitory to the medical campus, and then taking the students back, and also all these uh, communal fees like electricity, gas, and water are included in this fee. If you compare, for example, our dorms fee to the other fees, for example, in the city, that's relatively cheap because uh, overall, for example, it can and take about 300 USD or maybe a bit more if the student decides to live in an apartment. But in the dormitory uh, for 250 USD, the student can have the food, uh, free Wi-Fi, um, uh, as I said, the room, uh, private bathroom. And so that's very, very nice opportunity. We're offering uh, these opportunities to students uh, because that's our first year of the dormitory and want to have uh, this to have uh, you know the dormitory fully housed and I think that it's quite a good chance for students to start their first year um, in Tbilisi. When the students arrive we will pick up them at the airport and we can directly take them to the to the dorms. So in this case we are helping the students to to have lower lower living costs with the help of dorms. That's great. Thank you, Dr. Lash. So um, some of the questions that people are asking as well is, uh, what is the application deadline for September or this year? Um, that's also a great question. This is something I can answer as well. Now, we work with over 40 universities and the deadlines are different for each of them. But usually the application period starts from 
February, sometimes it ends in August or September. So if you don't have your A-level results yet or your uh, certificates yet, you can still apply with your predicted grades. The universities try to fill up their places as soon as possible. So you can actually start your application now and it's always, always good to prepare the documents for you in time. And, and if anything, COVID has taught us that deadlines don't mean much anymore because preparing the documents takes a while. We have to get the documents legalized, the postal translated, all the centers due to the, you know, the, the lockdown, we've not been able to kind of get them done in time. So it's always good to start early so we can be more prepared for you and take our time with, the degree, uh, with your uh, application and documents. Um, so to answer this question, applications are open now and you can get started. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Edmund. Uh, that's very good uh, and insightful. We always encourage students to contact us as soon as possible in order for you to secure your seat. We're here just to help you secure your seat and make sure that you're going to have an opportunity to pursue medicine. You already know that you want to pursue medicine. So why put off the uh, start in it? So let's get started and uh, make sure that you are able to pursue it. Um, on a separate note, we will be providing certificates of attendance for all our attendees. Thank you for staying until the end. So um, just follow in the chat the link that's been posted and just fill in the form and you'll receive an automatically generated certificate of attendance for the event. Um, another few questions that we're getting is, am I allowed to work in Eastern Europe while I'm studying? The question is, yes, of course you are. Usually on average, uh, countries will allow you to work for 20 hours per week, uh, depending on the country. But since there are also universities that are offering medicine online for the first three years, uh, like Dnipro, uh, you can uh, stay at home, study and work at the same time. So that way you can raise some funds. Uh, Edmund, how, uh, when students ask you usually about uh, funding their education, how would you advise them? Great question. Well, <laughs> a lot of the students that we talk to, they rely on uh, the most reliable banks in the world, their moms and dads, their parents. Um, and so with, with universities abroad, if you go abroad, you are considered an international student. So some students will rely on their parents, some students uh, will work actually and save up. Um, and some students might take up a personal loan. Obviously, this is something we, we can't help with, but for most cases, the students will be able to find something that's more affordable for them to be able to go for. Um, but the tuition fees, like we mentioned, they can be anything from 3,000 euros all the way to 20,000. So depending on what you feel you might be able to afford, um, you go for that and then we can help you with that. But most of the tuition fees, all of them are uh, self-funded. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Edmund. Uh, I want to ask uh, a question to our students, actually, uh, with regards to exams. Some students are worried, will I have enough time on the exams? Uh, are the exams really difficult to pass? Uh, will I be able to pursue medicine? So, Christina, uh, you've been uh, studying in Europe for a few years now. Would you be able to uh, give us some insight? Yeah, uh, sure. Um, I think anyone who's studying medicine needs to come into the field knowing that it's not an easy degree. But with that being said, if you have the discipline to work hard and study hard, then the exams really aren't that easy. Medicine is not there to trick you. Um, it's been around for years. All the information you need is online. We also have teachers to ask. So you need to take you know, self responsibility and you need to be dedicated to your studies. But with that being said, the tests aren't necessarily difficult. The content sometimes can be tricky, but if you know your content, the tests aren't hard. Um, one thing that students constantly freak out with, and I was one of them, was Croc 1, you get and it's like this enigma, and everyone's like, Croc 1, oh my goodness, Croc 1, and um, similar to the step one for USMLE, and you know, once I actually got down to sitting and studying and revising the material, once I started doing the past papers, it was relatively easy for me. So I wouldn't say that the tests are ridiculously hard and that we don't have enough time to prepare. You have a, as much time as you give yourself to prepare, if that makes sense. 
Thank you, uh, Christina. It's very insightful. If you guys have any more questions, just let us know. Uh, hopefully, we're going to wrap up very soon. Uh, uh, just one, one or two final questions. Uh, is Can you put me in touch with a uh, someone who's done their clinical rotations? Well, yes, uh, we got Emma on the webinar. Yes, of course, Emma was here and she spoke about her experience and how she did her rotations. Uh, she was studying in Dnipro and she did her rotations in the UK. And now she's part of the team of helping students with regards to uh, arranging the rotation. So if you'd like to speak to her one on one, then uh, just get in touch with us and uh, someone from our team will put you in touch with Emma, like uh, Edmund, for example. Um, so uh, any other questions that are coming in, just having a quick look, we're going to close off very soon. OK, while well, Osvin, you are doing this, I would like to mention something that was mentioned a little bit earlier which is regarding the different universities, deadlines and stuff like that. Um, we are constantly, and also regarding admission process and uh, meeting the requirements. Um, one thing about meddling students, the reason for it to be set up is to basically try and give every person who has the passion, who's willing to put in the good and the hard work and willing to sacrifice a little bit of his time to chase his dream and opportunity. So sometimes some universities would say, we'll only accept you if you have biology and chemistry. So we go and know that some people maybe didn't do biology and chemistry in high school. So we find universities that are willing to allow them to do maybe a foundation year and then continue in medicine, or maybe even study privately chemistry and biology and do an entrance exam and then continue in medicine or even accept them without having the biology and chemistry and just give people the opportunity down to the work experience they have and the passion they have and the personal statement that they will write in order to convince. So even some people sometimes are missing out on deadlines and stuff like that because most unis have deadlines around August time. So we constantly try to find universities that have February intakes, uh, winter intakes, uh, one of the universities that we've been talking about today, which is in Georgia, I was very excited, the fact they have different kind of intakes to the other universities we work with, so it gives more options. Uh, I believe they have something like September, December, and then a March intake, and probably another one. So the, we are constantly trying our best to open up new places that we haven't thought of, because I remember back in 2012, it was brand new for us to leave the UK to go to study abroad. And we're constantly trying to find new places that would accommodate, give you the chance to enjoy six years, open up your eyes, and as well to give every single person the opportunity from graduate entry to transfers, and as well as beginning from the first year, an opportunity. If you have finished high school, if you have done an internship, if you've gone down the different uh, B, B tech routes. So like, for example, Romania never accepted people with B tech. So we moved to Bulgaria where they took B tech. And then um, some, you know, some universities in Ukraine didn't accept B tech. So we founded like a personal agreement with one university to take people who have done uh, different kind of access to learning courses and all these things. So we are constantly working around the clock and through not only us i mean everybody involved all the doctors uh, even the birmingham opportunity with the university of birmingham in the uk coming and teaching the uk students who are traveling abroad which i have heard has been appreciated quite a lot by a lot of the students because it gives kind of a different insight a little twist and helps them be a bit more confident about going back to the uk uh, it came about through uh, students that are studying in the university who have helped us arrange these things. And because we are trying to be just a family, not a company, not a business, but more of a family and more of an organization that cares about each other because we are all involved in the medical field. Most of us are medical doctors and uh, medical students. So we understand each other's frustrations, uh, limitations, and as well as passion and dedication. So uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you all for helping us continue to find new opportunities and to find new windows where people can apply. Like Edmund said, maybe things close down in August for Romania, but they open up for Georgia, they open up for Ukraine, they open up for other places. So there'll always be a place and a space for you to keep going. 
and finally to put your feet on the ground and just chase that medical dream. Thank you, Dr. Sam. Uh, and to wrap it up finally as well, we'll put up our contact details on the screen shortly. Uh, don't forget to fill up the uh, certificate, the attendance form so you can get a certificate of attendance as well. Thank you all for joining us and staying until the end. Um, I hope we've provided you with as much information as possible. Obviously, we cannot do everything. We cannot say everything in two hours only. So we encourage you to contact us on these numbers listed here and on the email on our website as well. We have so much information that we put out out there for free just to guide you and help you. The reason we started this organization is to provide as much support, as much help and as much information as possible to students from doctors and medical students who pursued exactly this route before. We've all gone through it here. Every single speaker here has gone through the process, apart from Edmund, who is our advisor, who is surrounded by people like us. Uh, who've studied abroad or pursued their dream abroad. That's why we started this organization to give you an opportunity to give you the ability to pursue your dream to not feel like uh, um, the UK or USA or wherever you are in the world is stunting your growth. Your growth is our goal. We want you to be able to pursue your dream to pursue what you love and we would love to see you graduate and go back home to practice as doctors. We're really happy to have helped thousands of students like you before and uh, many hundreds of students who've graduated this year and last year and the year before as well and who have gone back to their countries and successfully uh, started working as doctors you can check this by contacting the medical councils in your countries as well like in the UK the general medical council or um, the Australian medical council you can contact them and verify this information for yourself there are so many people that have had the courage and they've gone through this route. Uh, don't miss out on this chance. It's an amazing opportunity that is offered to students like you. Uh, and it's a brilliant path and a really exciting and amazing adventure that will allow you to open up doors and opportunities from all over the world uh, into your life where you meet p amazing people, amazing teachers, amazing friends, and you will have uh, international contacts and then you'll be able to come back home. Uh, thank you all uh, as well, everyone from the panel, all our students, advisors and uh, doctors who have joined us today. Uh, thank you for your time. We've gone a little bit overboard and uh, uh, I'm sure all the students really appreciate all the information and time that you have given today. Uh, so thank you to everyone again. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you on our phone numbers here for any country that you are in or on the email address as well. Uh, great job, everyone, and have a good evening.